Hi, Paul Beck with uh, University of Ottawa, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, Carleton University, Geography, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. I'm talking about the methane funnels or blowholes or craters in Siberia that are occurring because of climate change. Climate change is thawing the permafrost, it's thawing the, the methane hydrates, gas is being released, it shoots up through the soils under high pressure, creating blowholes, that gas then goes up into the atmosphere. This is happening on land, it's also happening under the oceans. Um, I'm discussing the uh, what's happening on the land and I was just in the previous video is where I ended off here. We have certain ignitability limits for methane. So about eight per, eight and a half percent of methane by volume um, will, will ignite very, very easily. And then as you go to less lower concentrations or higher concentrations, it takes more energy to ignite the methane. And there's certain limits. If you're, if you're too low or too high, the methane won't ignite at all. Okay, so what we're seeing, this is an interesting diagram. So I was wondering, okay, are the pressures high enough in the ground to cause the methane to auto ignite and then to um, blow out the big chunk of soil? Of course, there's very little oxygen deep in the, in the uh, presumably in the sediment. So how could you get an explosion? So maybe it's just a really high pressure. It starts ejecting the um, sediments and the permafrost and the ice, it blows chunks out and meets with the oxygen in the air and ignites possibly. Um, so there's an auto ignition here. If this is temperature, auto ignition temperature is here. So there's a mixture, the fuel concentration, you know, there's a mixture for gases where the auto ignition is the easiest. We saw in the previous slide it was about eight and a half percent for methane. As you go higher and lower, it's harder to ignite. Um, some properties of methane. Um, here we go. Flammable limits in air by volume: five point three to fourteen percent. Okay, about eight and a half is what um, where where it's uh, easiest to ignite. Auto ignition temperature: five hundred ninety-five Celsius. This will be at one atmosphere. So you got to go to really high temperatures. So if the methane is auto igniting in the ground and one, there has to be oxygen and two, it has to be very high temperatures. How could it be such high temperatures unless it came from deep within the earth? So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that that's happening. I think it, it ignites when it comes out and it's high pressure and it meets the oxygen. Um, Although the, a lot of more recent, like this, we don't, we don't really know for sure. When, when, when methane does burn, there's something called the adiabatic flame temperature. So if you burn natural gas uh, from a nozzle or something, then that's the temperature of the flame, the hottest part of the flame. So methane's in here somewhere. There's methane, um, 1963 degrees Celsius. That's the flame temperature of methane and that's in Fahrenheit 3565 okay so that that's to do with um, that's how hot the flame burns when it burns um, what do we have here this is the auto ignition temperature of methane air mixtures function of pressure the equivalence ratio that would be 2% or 14.3% okay so let's have a look at this uh, view large Okay, so if the methane's in a spherical vessel versus a cylindrical vessel, this is how the, this is how the, as the pressure increases, the auto ignition temperature decreases, but these numbers are still very high. So in the ground, you know, as the pressure is building up, you know, it's going to ignite. It needs a fairly hot temperature to ignite. You know, unless there's, maybe there's friction, a static electricity or something, some spark, you know, maybe there's some source spark which ignites it. Um, this is showing, this is for the 2% uh, methane in the air. You go to higher concentrations of methane, 14%, and it lowers these temperatures slightly. You still get a curve like this, but the temperatures are lowered. So six or 700 Kelvin, subtract 273, call it 300. That's about 400 degrees Celsius or something, the ignition temperature.
Okay, so uh, let me, I tried to figure out, okay, let's find out more about these craters. So just Google Siberian methane craters, went to Google Scholar. I have access to all of these papers. Um, so this is uh, blowout craters on the Arctic seafloor. So I'll do a separate video about this. I think that's important. Um, so what I did find is I found, I found some decent papers here. This is a paper on the Arctic seafloor, which I'll talk about. But here's a couple papers on these deep craters in Siberia. Okay, so basically, uh, they did field visits shortly after it happened. This is 2014, I believe. This is after um, one of these first field visits that happened. So they measured the, they looked at the water content, the uh, ice content, the, uh, they, they measured methane levels at the bottom of the crater, et cetera, stuff like that. So they say that the, you know, they say it's climate fluctuations, climate change, climate increases in temperature. Um, and they hadn't seen this landform before. It hadn't been previously reported, which is a bit of a surprise maybe because, you know, there's so many circular features in Siberia and it looks like these these are all craters that are and and you know something had to cause them i'm surprised somebody didn't say well it's methane that has been blowing out these craters and we're going to start seeing these things happen as far as i know we haven't seen any of these things in alaska yet but that is only a matter of time i think so so anyway they looked at the uh so they looked at the you know they wondered how the gas could be triggered uh, warmer air triggers the rapid changes, thawing the ice and so on, creating, so, so they tried to look at the origins of this. And, um, okay, so let's go down to some images here. So these are some of the climate uh, conditions, you know, in this region, mean average temperatures and stuff. It was 2013 when it happened, it was quite warm. In, 24, in 2012, um, in 2011, it was quite warm, warmer than two very warm years, um, still below zero mean annual temperatures, and then thaw indexes were high, and then boom, we got these craters. Okay, so, so here's the, uh, there's a lake here, and there's landslides on the surface of the lake. Okay, there's a hole here, and then around it, they call it the parapet. Okay, so this crater, gentle slopes. If you go inside the crater, there's loams, there's ground ice, and then there's clays, there's different materials in the crater. Okay, this is a, something called the thermocirc. So this is not a little bit different from a crater, could be like a thaw slump, um, hot, you know, very hot, permafrost is thawing, um, parts of the ground are slumping. Of course, we're getting a lot more rain there than snow. Okay, um, here's some areas at the top of the crater, silty and loamy, high icy deposits. You can see the ice inside the soils. Um, they, they're so-called clay blocks. Um, this is a, an interesting image. So this crater is 25 meters this funnel is 25 meters, okay, or the cylinder. There's looks like there's a funnel feature here extending out um, 30 meters, okay? And then 70 meters, they call it the parapet, okay? You can see this other, you know, this is either material that was just pushed out and blown out or stuff deposited here. And then, of course, stuff is blown over very long distances. So parapet, upper funnel, and inner hole size. Okay, this, here we go here, and this is showing some regions on a different scale. This is some different debris that they located. Um, they say that they measured radioactivity and methane concentration. Radioactivity is at a normal level. Methanes range from 2.8 to 0.3% outside the hole, 9.6 to 9.8 inside the crater. Any spark inside the crater and this thing is gonna blow. Okay, and that would make the crater bigger, uh, much higher than normal methane levels. These are some pieces of the clay that were found at different regions. 
Um, distance from the crater, from the rim, okay, as you go 75 meter away, 0.5 to 1 meter blocks, okay, going up to 125 meters away, 0.1 to 0.2 meter blocks blown out at different distances. And he, here's the concentrations in the crater, 9.6 to 9.8%, okay, and then around the crater, 0.3 to 2.8%. Okay, so this is a very interesting paper. Um, and here's some stuff here. Okay, so the, here's where we are. This is October 1st, 2013, a year, uh, spot five and Landsat. So this is kind of what you see. Um, Landsat eight, a little bit later, you can see, you know, it looks like something's happening here. The resolution is not great. And then Landsat 8 in 2014, subsequent months, big crater here. Okay, here it looks like it's probably covered in ice and stuff. Okay, so that gives you a time series of the crater. Okay, so there's some information. And now we have an, some more information on this guy. So this is gas blowouts. This is mostly pictures I'm going to show you on the Yamal and Gaiden peninsulas. Okay, this is 2015 after they shortly after they discovered it. Okay, so this is the region here in the Arctic. Okay, this is the uh, this is the region we're talking about. Okay, this is blown up to here. This is the Yamal and the Gaiden Peninsula. These are regions where they found these these uh, blowholes. Okay, they were hypothesizing what happened. It's not a meteorite. It's not UFOs. You know, all the craters look like the results of huge explosions. So here we go. This is one of the big guys, gas blowout crater here. Okay, um, and then this is, this is a pingo, a typical pingo in this region. So the soil and the earth and the vegetation is all pushed up by the pressure from within the earth. Uh, pingos are generally pushed up by ice wedges so there should really be another name for this type of feature and it should be separated from a pingo. Um, but that's what we're doing now, reusing that term. Here's a guy climbing inside, you know, he's got an oxygen masks and stuff and you don't want any spark. You don't want to, you know, a lot of Russians smoke and this guy, they don't smoke down in the bottom of these things because kaboom, you know, it's a quick way to go. Um, just to give you an idea of the size and the ice walls, you know, it's pretty hard to climb these things. Okay, so this is before and after. This is August 1st, 2009, um, July 19th, 2013. So here we go. You can see some sort of feature here. This is probably the ground being elevated outwards. The drainage is different, so the vegetation is growing differently here, and then you can see the blowhole there. Um, here's another one. Okay, these things fill with water fairly quickly. Okay, here's a smaller guy. Okay, here we go. So this is July 4th, 09, July 21st, 13. So you can see this whole thing has been blown out here. Okay, before and after. So we're finding these things all over. Here's a lake, and it looks like, look at all the holes inside the lake. Looks like methane is starting to, is coming out, um, and there's little craters there. Further study, etc. Okay, so, okay, so here's, we, here's where we have, so the headline of the Siberian Times, two new craters are forming, okay? Instead, of, we now know that a lot of the, the methane ignites in a lot of these things. We have eyewitnesses for these craters. We have a village of people that see flashes in the sky. They see, they know the terrain. They see what it looks like before and after. And what they're finding is that the methane is doing incredibly crazy things. Big bangs and pillars of fire as these craters, as the methane is released. So... This is, uh, this is very, very significant um, work. Very, very, uh, this, is a, this is one of the big surprises with climate change. We're gonna see more and more of this in the future and wait, uh, watch out Alaska, thank you.